You're listening to The Dead Prussian, a podcast about war and warfare. We've talked about war and art on this show before. In fact, we've talked about graphic novels. We've talked about theatre and war, not the theatre of war. And we have talked about connecting fiction with war and using that area of creativity. Now, you all know I'm a fan of creative practice. One area we haven't gotten in depth into is the link between visual art representation of military technology, and in particular, how the representation of militarized technology can address our relationship with war and also with technology. Now, I'd love to say that I can tell you all about it, but as you know, I'm not the expert. G'day, listeners, and welcome to the Dead Prussian Podcast, the only podcast named after a 19th century Prussian military thinker. Now, I'm not sure if it is the only podcast, but I have been saying it for so long that I'm just going to keep it in my show notes. I'm Mick, your host, probably the humblest host you know, not as humble anymore because you might have heard that on another show I host, Defence Research, we've recently been awarded a gold award in the .com awards, which was pretty cool. So I can now say award-winning as opposed to near award-winning. Thank you very much for all those listeners that have joined our bespoke social media network, the TDP community. You can jump on our website at www.thedeadprussian.com and click on the TDP community if you would like to join. On there, you have access to our forums, you have access to our bonus question content, and you also have access to our transcripts, which are coming along slowly, but surely there'll be some new transcripts uploaded uh, by the time this episode goes to air, and we are following in rapid succession a few more transcripts i've got a better process now so you'll start to see the transcripts appearing and finally thank you to all those people leaving reviews it has been fantastic to see the community engaged uh, and helping spread the word about the show now enough about how good the show is because you already know that because you've downloaded the show let's talk about art and let's talk about my guest my guest today is Catherine brimblecombe fox she's a visual artist and a phd student and her art focuses on militarized technology and systems, the increasing military interest in the electromagnetic spectrum, the landscape, and very important to this crowd listening, the future of war. Catherine, thank you very much for coming on the show. Mick, thank you for having me. Now, Catherine, before we start discussing the visual representation of militarized technology in our relationship with it, which sounds like it probably won't only take a couple of minutes to discuss because it's a really simple topic. Um, I'm really keen to learn about what got you interested in becoming an artist in the first place. Well, Mika, I've always been an artist uh, in a way, and I had my first exhibition at 17. I sold my first painting at 14, and my mother was a great uh, encourager of my painting and my interest in art, as she was with my two brothers. I then went to the University of Queensland and did art history. So it wasn't a practice-led degree, but it was art history. And I worked at the National Gallery in Canberra. I then married and moved to uh, Gundawindi, which is in Western Queensland. And I returned to my painting back out in Gundawindi and uh, I started to work on landscape Uh, but not at your typical traditional landscape. But I remembered back as a child when I was painting that I could fly. I flew over my parents' grain farm outside Dolby on the Darling Downs. And even though I'd never been in an aeroplane above it, I knew what it looked like from above. So that aerial view has been a persistent theme through my work for a long time. And it's it's really intersected very well into my interest in militarised technology. But, but previous to that, I developed great interests in cosmology, so that's looking at the study of the universe. Mm. And I read a book called Our Final Century by the Lord Astronomer, um, Lord Martin Rees, and it goes into various apocalyptic scenarios that could see the demise of humanity or mm. the collapse of civilization, And so it's existential risks posed by emerging technologies. So with my aerial view, my cosmic look, the interest in cosmology, I developed this interest in uh, existential risk. And then um, five years ago, I started a master's, a master by research at the University of Queensland. Mm-hmm. And I narrowed my topic from existential risk posed by emerging technologies to looking at militarized technology. 
It's fascinating your journey uh, as an artist. I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that you could fly. Um, you don't have to teach me that. Um, and, and that that led you to um, you know ap- apocalyptic scenarios, which then brought you back to more studies. Um, it's, it does not sound like it was a boring journey at all. Um, and I'm sure there are many artists that have had less of an interesting journey. And and you know you talked about your master's of research, and you also talked about. Um, you know, uh, you mentioned it wasn't a practice-led uh, study. We'll talk about practice-led studies later, I think, in this interview. One, because I'm I'm doing a practice-led PhD as well. So yes. uh, we're just with less talent. Um, but w- what I'm interested in understanding about it, uh, and I, I think I, I gather this from, you know, when you sold your first painting when you were 14, which is good because you sold your first painting before before your first exhibition. Which is yes, just, yes. And I'm not sure if that's normal, but that's, that's excellent. Um, the salesman in, in me uh, absolutely respects someone that can sell something before the buzz has gone around about the product. <laughs> but um, I'm keen to understand what sort of medium you use to explore the relationships between militarized technology, society, and the future of war. I mean, I've seen your paintings. I think they're they're amazing. Uh, but I think our listeners would really get a kick out of understanding what the medium is that you use. Well, uh, two basic mean, mediums. One is oil paints on Belgian linen, so very good quality linen, and works on paper using gouache or watercolour. And so I, I introduce a deliberate accident by, in the creation of the backgrounds of my paintings. So I let uh, the paint pool, drip, spread, um, dry slowly. I manipulate it. I, I, I leave it overnight. And so the, this kind of um, controlled accident becomes the cosmic background for my work. And depending on which medium it is, the paint reacts in a different way. And then over the top of those backgrounds, I paint these uh, cosmic, what I call cosmic landscapes, mm. whereby I invite the viewer to fly with me. So going back to your request for me to teach you <laughs> about the flying, in my paintings, I, there is an invitation to the viewer to come flying with me. And when I've got, uh, say, drones or satellites or ground control stations, I've got maybe have the pale blue dot representing Earth, mm. the viewer can fly above, below, around, behind, in front. So it's it's a way of inviting new perspectives, particularly in a, in a society where we live only a few centimetres from our screens. It's a way of broadening the horizon. I like that because uh, the benefit of this show is people can move around when they when they listen to it because there is no time. <laughs> but also because I'm a, I'm a screen addict um, myself. Um, and I, I think for those people um, who don't know that Australia's gone through a series of lockdowns, I'm recording this from lockdown. Uh, Catherine's quite, quite free at the moment. Um, that's a pandemic lockdown. I'm not. I'm not actually in prison, but <laughs> no. um, it's 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 something that's quite interesting to be able to gain perspective from what appears as a two dimensional medium, but is able to give you that that depth. And you know, when you talk about you know the cosmological influence on you on your work, um, some of, some of your paintings look almost like you know the the images you see from NASA uh, of the night sky and and the Hubble telescope like you know a little bit a little bit different because one's painting and the other one's a, a digital representation of uh, radiographic data um but still um quite fascinating um which which really struck me um and I, I love the reds you use because um you know there's nothing more Australian than red red soil um it's also you know quite popular in Africa as well but Australia lace claimed everyone's everything so we can say it's it's very, very Australian, um, which kind of, I guess, kind of links back to Gunda Windy. Um, now, your art focuses on militarised technology and you talk about uh, your studies uh, as a Master's of Research um, and you, your understanding of, you know, this cosmological influence, this, um, you talk about the, the Lord Astronomer, which I think is one of the best terms ever. Yes, isn't it? <laughs> Um, it's a title I'm now aiming for. Um, I think I've got a bit of stuff here to do. I'm going to be the Lord podcaster, actually. Um, but uh, your art focuses on militarised technology and its relationship with war and society. I'm keen to understand where that journey, where, how you got there, what the journey was, and what motivated you to focus on military technology in your art. You've, you've kind of talked to us about your journey, um, but I guess it's a big sort of switch, I guess, from from art artist. Um, then going through and then you know deciding to do an academic work 
that influences your art that addresses a large societal issue? Yes, well, it's a good question because uh, we, my master's by research was in cultural studies and art history. So I wanted to look at two Australian painters, John Catapan and George Gittos. John has been an official war artist in Timor-Leste in 2008 and George Giddos has been in war and conflict zones since um, 1986 when he went to Nicaragua during the Sandinista Revolution. And I was going to, I focused on the, the representations of militarised technology in their paintings, particularly through night vision uh, technology because both had had opportunities to be with Australian either peacekeeping forces or other kind of forces on night patrols and both had used the night vision technology. But I'm very interested in the technical side and I, I of of technology and so and I knew that in terms of my visual analyses of both artists' work that I wanted to have an integrity in the the propositions that I was making. So I decided that along with cultural studies research uh, and some art historical research, that technical research into contemporary militarised technology, uh, drones, night vision technology, surveillance technology, increasing um, autonom increasingly autonomous systems, drone swarming, uh, the electromagnetic spectrum, signalling, all of those things would provide me with uh, the kind of information that when I was discussing these paintings, people would say, you know, well, she, she knows what she's talking about. As a result of the technical research, uh, I'd come back from university, I lived within walking distance of the university, and I'd paint. And so the research would fed back into my practice. And I didn't do any oil paintings during the time that I did the master's degree because they take too long. I, I did a, um, a huge number of works on paper. And as a result of working through my research through creative practice, it then fed insights back into the research, you know, academic research. And it was the most fulfilling and uh, wonderful time for me as a practitioner um, and I'm happy to report that my thesis was met with great approval. <laughs> that's, that's beneficial, isn't it? Um, it would be a, a shame if it wasn't. Um, but then again, I guess it's back to the drawing board. It's interesting that you talk about George Giddo's work. A lot of Australians will know his work from uh, Australians serving over in, I'm pretty sure it was Rwanda or maybe Somalia. Um, and the, the, the photo of, um, of Trooper Jonathan Church is uh, probably one of the most iconic um, photos from representing Australia's operational experiences in the 1990s. And the good thing about studying your master's uh, on art and in art and famous artists such as George Giddos, as I mentioned before, who took that iconic photo um, of you know, the, the Australian experience of, of peacekeeping in the 1990s, is that now you're studying a PhD that focuses on creative practice. Um, are you able to tell us a little bit about your studies now and how it relates to your art on militarised technology? Sure. Well, the PhD is a creative practice-led um, research degree, so it's the first time I've actually done a creative practice degree. But I'm looking at um, using a term I've come up with called imaginational metavalence. So it's related to the idea of flying, cosmology, using the imagination I deliberately stick to painting because it's not connected to any digital or cyber technologies. Therefore, I'm separate from the system that I'm actually critiquing, yet I can still critique it. So I'm not being absorbed into it and potentially becoming embedded within, you know, what Tung Huey Hugh calls the, um, the sort of the ethics of the, the cloud kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm using this idea of imaginational metavalence, which is a kind of oversight um, a surveillance of the surveillance you're using one's imagination to look at those aspects of uh, contemporary and potentially future war and the technologies that are used that are invisible. 
So signals, for instance, I'm really interested in, in signals, which is my broadened into my interest in the electromagnetic spectrum. So when I was doing my master's degree and I was coming home and painting through the research or the technical research, I was drawing lines between, say, satellites, drones, ground control stations. I was drawing lines radiating out from the drones to indicate the 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 uh, area of their sensors, you know, imaging sensors and so forth. And so this has led me to thinking about, well, the invisible aspects of contemporary war um, are, the, are associated with speed. So speed of signal delivery, for instance, is at light speed. And as a result of this increasing interest and need for speed, there is this again, accelerating need for to keep up with it. And also, how do we do that as human beings? So we bring in more autonomous systems because human beings can't keep up with the speed of operation of a lot of the technology. And then we have a, contest, a contested and congested frequency environment. So there are technologies being developed to mitigate that and um, broadening the use of the spectrum as well as using artificial intelligence, for instance, to skip across radio frequencies so that, uh, that, 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 that the signalling is optimised, even if it's only for a, 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 moment, a moment on one bandwidth then goes across to an axe, you know, and they're using artificial intelligence for that. So I see the environment from land to orbiting satellites occupied by these invisible infrastructures. And, and interestingly, um, essentially, I'm looking at how militaries are paying closer attention to the electromagnetic spectrum as an enabler of technology, as a type of fires, as a manoeuvre space and a domain. And interestingly, the Department of Defense, the US Department of Defence last year came out with a couple of documents relegating the term electronic warfare as a legacy term and replacing it with electromagnetic warfare. And in Australia, I think it's in South Australia, there is um, 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 a university attached to some military research looking at you know, the electromagnetic spectrum and the military use of that as well. So it's early days, but as uh, the invisibility of the um, signalling is interesting because once you start to visualise it, you see relationships not only between technologies, you see this infiltration of landscape with these new kinds of sort of um, nets that surround the environment or are part of the environment. And so I parody a lot of computer imagery in my paintings as well to demonstrate how uh, see geolocating graphics or terrain visualisation graphics are actually uh, um, kind of making our landscapes into computational zones. And then as a result of all of this, you can look at the invisible relationships between industry, the military, politics and society. It's, uh, it's a very interesting connection you've made between uh, things like signals and uh... And, and it's intersection with the landscape because anyone who's tried to get a radio working in the jungle will definitely understand that. I should say too that a lot of this interest stems from the fact that my father, while, while he was a farmer, uh, a grain farmer, he was also a very, very enthusiastic ham amateur radio operator. So I grew up with uh, gadgets and gizmos, aerials, antennae, um, when I was a baby uh, in the early 60s, he made our first television set on the dining room table. In 1957, he was one of the, he was only about 20, I think, in 1957. He was one of the hams from around the world who was conscripted by the Jet Propulsion Unit that had too much interference there when Sputnik 1 went up and there was someone there who was a ham and they got hams from around the world to send coordinates back to the US and my father was one of them. It's amazing connections there, isn't it, the... Um... I suppose it's like the invisible threads that link us um, throughout throughout different generations, and uh, yeah, I'm just I'm just trying to build on that invisible infrastructure as well, so it's generational as well. Uh, yes, the the use of the term fires that that warms the uh, warms the cockles of my artilleryman heart uh, because I know that a lot of artillery um, people, particularly ones that uh, I've interacted with uh, plan uh, electromagnetic effects in their in their in their targeting matrices as a type of fire um, which sometimes means that 
the electronic warfare or electromagnetic warfare officers uh, tend to spend more time with artillerymen than they'd probably care to. Uh, but that's the role of the liaison officer, spending time with people you otherwise wouldn't like to. Now, talking about spending time with people you do like to, you've recently, and this is where we met, actually, you've recently exhibited your art at the Australian Defence Force College, which is not a, a creative school of um, art aficionados. It's not somewhere where you'd expect creative works to be on display as a as a central event. But uh, you recently at the um, Arts at ADC event, uh, I think it was the very first one they did, uh, they exhibited uh, your artwork and we went along, we got to listen to a little bit about uh, your your art and the meaning and then we got to sit there and um, go, go and have a look at your art, which was amazing. Um, are you able to provide us a background on that particular exhibit and uh, and what the experience was like as an artist to be invited to the home of the Australian War College to talk about your art and show your art? Well, I was thrilled to be invited and it was in fact um, Colonel Richard Barrett who is, gave me the invitation to be included in the inaugural Arts at ADC event. And as you know, he's also uh, an artist, a sculptor, and he had some work in it, along with also Major Anne Goyne with her evocative and rather poignant um, drawings. And Richard's two sculptures that are in the courtyard there are quite outstanding and are full of meaning as well. So uh, it was interesting to be involved with it because the program is a new program and it's for ADC staff, students, alumni, and members of the community, so who are engaged in contemporary defence issues and wanting to look at these issues through creative ideas and creative practice. So um, Major Kate Carter is a real dynamo behind it, and she's really keen to have visual art, poetry, um, um, theatre, all sorts of different ways for people to engage with questions about um, defence in these creative ways. And I think it's excellent because I know, um, for instance, the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk, which is at Cambridge University, they actually talk about the fact that they encourage multiple disciplines to come to the table to talk about these things because there is a recognition these days that multiple different disciplines means different kinds of questions mm. and you know the stakes are pretty high these days with the way speed and technology and not only the speed of the operation of the technology but the speed of the development of the technology and how the legal and ethics issues keep pace not only as humans how do we keep pace with it but how do some of our um, safeguards in terms of social social infrastructures and legislations keep pace with it. So it's very important, I think, to include as many disciplines in discussions as possible. And this is a case where the um, Australian Defence College has opened itself to this kind of opportunity. And I must say, I've, I've found the people that I talked with there over a number of visits and during my artist talk, very encouraging, very open, very interested, um, didn't shy away from some of the critiques that are embedded in my work, were willing to engage. And it was almost as if the artwork allowed them to speak because in, in, you know, probably a little bit more bluntly than normal because it wasn't actually them saying it was their reaction to the art. You know, it kind of created a, um, a way of, a, a way to have a conversation. Now, knowing a lot of people out at ADC, I'm not sure we'd encourage them to be more blunt than normal, but it's great to see them <laughs> more, more, more open and candid. And uh, that's the purpose of art, right? It's to, it's to, it's to make us think to help us uh, think in a different way and then, you know, force a conversation, force a discussion um, in a nice way. Um, it's better when you're being forced by something that's quite interesting and, and, and evocative as opposed to being forced to answer a question because you're at the War College and you're sitting in a syndicate room and someone has told you it's your turn to answer the question. It's, it's much <laughs> lovelier to go to the mess and, uh, and see some artwork and then have a discussion with the artist over the themes. Um, which is fantastic. And I have one more art-related question before we go on to the bonus and then the final question. So my, my final question related to art and, uh, and the future of war. Um, now, this might be a little bit subjective, um, given my own leanings, my own current studies and research, um, which uh, sounds, you know, 
quite quite is quite different to to yours, except uh, we're still both doing um, a practice led um, PhD. So it's great because the best thing about um, creative practice led uh, research is that uh, many mediums can be used to address lots of different issues. Um, so I want to understand why it's important for us to use art to explain art to explain. I don't think we could ever explain the future of war, but why is it important for us to use art to explore the future of war? And also something that I'm picking up a lot um, from your artwork is our, and I mean society, but also, you know, the military aspect of it, um, relationship with technology. Well, I think art doesn't provide answers. It actually can trigger questions. And so with artists um, who are informed about technology, who are informed about the issues associated with the technology, they can pose interesting uh, dilemmas with that are, uh, can be perceived within their paintings. And often, and I found this at the Australian Defence College, uh, people saw things that I hadn't seen. So once, a, in my case, once a painting is exhibited, I lose control over it. And that's a great thing because it means that it's actually working. Mm. And, you know, if it's triggering conversations, it's actually it's actually really working. The thing is in terms of broader society with technology, because um, there's a kind of homogenising process uh, happening because we're all reliant on the same kinds of digital and cyber platforms, it means that, uh, well, one thing that I'm really interested in and concerned about is the militarizability of civilian technology. And, and so, you know, the our mobile phones, our Fitbits, our computers, our, the GPS systems in our cars can be used from, you know, tracking uh, all, a, a, a variety of reasons. And you've got information warfare, you've got terms like hybrid warfare, you've got grey zone warfare, you've got all of these things that actually embroil the wider society into it. And this sort of melting of terrorism into war, into... Um, um, you know, counter-terrorism, counter-insurgency and information warfare and you've got viruses and you've got manipulation of um, uh, elections, we're all involved. And this, this diffusion or this collapse of military security and policing with society is um, a concern. And, and as we move into the future, what does that mean? Uh, um, and, you know, Major General Rick Burr in the Accelerated Warfare um, document in 2018, and the, la the first sentence of the last paragraph, we must pull the future towards us rather than wait for it. And in a way, I see imaginational metavalence as a way of going into the future and kind of um, um, being like a devil's advocate to that, what I call a militarised imagination that's, that's gone into the future. I like that you um, mentioned, you know, art doesn't provide answers, provides questions, which is probably the most important thing we require from our, our, our military leaders is to be inquisitive. Um, because you know, Essentially, their job is to do some very nasty stuff um, and do it um, as cheaply as possible in terms of blood and treasure. Um, so having them ask questions all the time is good. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of staff officers out there who probably want our commanders to be asking less questions. Um, but... Yeah, such is the life of the staff officer. Now, uh, we're going to have a quick uh, pause so that we can switch to our bonus question. Our bonus questions uh, on the show, they are provided to those members who uh, subscribe to our own social media network, the TDP community. So I have a quick pause. Thank you for the answer to that uh, bonus question, uh, Catherine. Uh, very, very fascinating. And uh, for those listeners who want to hear it, you'll have to subscribe. Now, Catherine, my final question is one I ask all guests. Um, it's uh, it's ticket price uh, to the exhibit that is the Dead Prussian Podcast, and it relates to our mission on the show, which is to define war in as many ways as possible, just like Big Carl, the Dead Prussian himself. I ask each guest to finish the sentence, war is. So right now, Catherine, I ask you to finish the sentence, war is. Well, Mick, I'm answering it with, uh, and it's highly speculative and imaginational, so it fits in with this interview. So war has mutated into a contagion that has infected speed and time in ways that make the theatre of war potentially endlessly everywhere. Mm. That is definitely an original answer on the show, and after 105 episodes, 
Um, you know, I thought we might be pushing it, but uh, it looks like we've got plenty of room to grow. That is absolutely fantastic. Um, I think uh, I don't think there's too many people there who will dispute the contagion aspect of it. So um, that's a brilliant uh, definition, and and even better, it's been a brilliant chat, uh, Catherine. Thank you very much uh, for one. Um, actually listening to this random person that approached you at, uh, at an exhibition and said, hey, would you like to come on my show? Um, and two, putting up with the length of time it took me to schedule the show. Um, you'd be amazed at how much uh, lockdowns actually throw sh- um, home studio schedules out. They, they do a lot. Um, so, Catherine, thank you very much for coming on the Deb Russian podcast. Thank you, Mick. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Now, listeners, uh, please uh, check out uh, the show notes. You'll see links there to Catherine's blog. Uh, you'll be able to see... Uh, examples of her work for those people who are in Australia keep an eye out for when she's exhibiting and also you can follow her on Twitter at Brimblecomb and uh, Brimblecomb is it's just a fun word but it's spelt B-R-I-M-B-L-E-C-O-M-B-E so probably the easiest Twitter handle anyone out there has actually got Um, that's absolutely fantastic and until next time listeners grab a book and crack on Join the conversation with us on Twitter at Dead Prussian Pod, on Facebook at The Dead Prussian Page, or on our website www.thedeadprussian.com. All show notes for this episode, as well as copyright information, can be found on the website. The Dead Prussian Podcast is written, produced, and hosted by Mick Cook. It is co produced by Amanda Levito. The music used throughout is Caught in the Beat by Broke for Free and is used under a Creative Commons Attribution license. All opinions expressed by individuals on the podcast are those of the individual and not necessarily representative of any other organisation.